Hi everyone, uh, you join us here at the Air Force Museum of New Zealand's Large Conservation Workshop. Um, we're going to be talking for the next wee while about our uh, newest and probably most challenging project, the Vickers Wildebeest. Uh, the Vickers Wildebeest was a mid-1930s British designed uh, large biplane aircraft, fairly typical of the types that were being designed around about that time. Uh, a large single engine biplane of all metal construction. So we're talking about that transitional period where uh, wood and fabric were gradually being left behind and being replaced by new alloys and all metal aircraft designs. Uh, it's a very large biplane, four metres to the top of the uh, top main plane uh, and carried a crew of three. The Vickers Wildebeest uh, is a very significant aircraft in the uh, history of New Zealand military aviation. It was the first fleet to be purchased new by the New Zealand government in the mid-1930s and its arrival heralded uh, a step change uh, in how uh, the RNZF or the fledgling RNZF went about its business. Uh, the aircraft's arrival necessitated the construction of new infrastructure, uh, larger, newer hangars, uh, and ground crew and crews, flight crews, had to be trained, of course, how to maintain and operate the type. Uh, generally speaking, interwar biplanes of this uh, type are extremely rare uh, glo globally, and uh, New Zealand actually is unique uh, in having the privilege of being one of the very few places, if not the only place in the world, where you can find the remains of uh, interwar biplanes of this type. Um, other types that the RNZF operated at the same time, uh, the Blackburn Baffin and the uh, Fairy Gordon, uh, there are also remains uh, of those aircraft uh, in New Zealand. So as a, as a national museum, uh, we decided it was important that we do something with, uh, with the structure that we have, even though uh, from a curatorial and uh, an engineering perspective, it is quite a challenge. The structure that we have comes from a number of Wildebeest airframes and indeed uh, some parts also from uh, Vickers Vincent aircraft, a close relative of the Wildebeest that was also operated by the RNZAF. But the majority of the structure we have we know to be from NZ102, so that's the identity we've given the project. The museum first started to look at uh, doing something with the Wildebeest almost 20 years ago. And some progress has been made in that time. You can see next to me here, we have almost a complete uh, fuselage frame, which shows beautifully the, uh, the construction uh, method that Vickers were using at the time. We have uh, tubular framing, obviously uh, wire braced, typical of aircraft of the period. Um, and this amount of progress was achieved um, on and off over 20 years. Uh, it hasn't been a priority project, unfortunately, because we've had other major projects uh, on the go. Um, but we've decided to make it the centrepiece of, of what we're doing now and really focus on trying to move this forward um, because of its significance and rarity. Well, the Wildebeest project has a number of challenges, uh, not least of which the fact that we have no engineering drawings for the aircraft. Uh, as far as we can tell, and as best as our research has been able to, uh, to find out, they haven't survived anywhere in the world. We are still hopeful that the Brooklands Museum in the UK, uh, the, who hold the Vickers uh, Company Archive, may well come up with something from uh, a significant amount of material that they have currently uncatalogued, but uh, the chances are fairly slim. So, as you can imagine, uh, trying to piece together an aircraft of this complexity and size without the drawings to guide you is, is quite a challenge. Um, we are adopting a process of reverse engineering where we take wreckage uh, similar to uh, that that you see here um, and through painstakingly dismantling that wreckage, learning as much as we can about how to put the aircraft back together. Um, it's a bit like um, having a 3,000 piece jigsaw puzzle uh, and no box top photo to show you how it should go together. Um, but we, we are taking uh, the, 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 you know, the best conservation approach that we can. Every original piece that has structural integrity and can be reattached to the project will be. Uh, we are painstakingly removing every small bracket that we possibly can to reuse. 
And what we can't reuse, we're using to glean as much information we can about the types of material that we used uh, and how the aircraft was put together. Vickers were using at the time an interesting uh, tapered wedge method for connecting all of the main structural members. Uh, and we're having to make uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of those uh, tapered uh, pins uh, to put the structure together. Um, and of course, as well as the technical challenges, there are the, the challenges around researching the history of the aircraft as well. And uh, for the first time, uh, for us as a museum, uh, we've taken the approach of putting together uh, a multidisciplinary team uh, where we have curators, uh, researchers, technicians uh, around the table contributing uh, their input to the planning and execution of the project all at the same time, which uh, you know, really helps with that, that vital uh, curator-conservator relationship uh, that, that is so important to, to, for a successful outcome with projects like this. So my part in this project has been to look at the background of what this particular wildebeest did during its time with the RNZAF. And it's been a bit of a detective story. The big problem we have is that many of the records from that era were not preserved. Um, once they were used, they were disposed of, um, particularly operational records and records relating to aircraft movements. So we don't have the archives here in New Zealand on aircraft that perhaps some other countries do. So this means it becomes a bit of a detective story, just as the technical side is a bit of a detective story. So what we've done is we've taken a very kind of creative approach of looking at lots of different types of records and visual um, resources to try and find out exactly what this wildebeest got up to when it was over here before it was eventually um, broken down. So what we've got are different types of records a few official records, some of the unit histories of the places where it served do mention it, particularly in a couple, on a couple of occasions when it had a little mishap here um, in, uh, at Wigram when it was a training aircraft. And further research then led us to actually look at the, the wider circumstances of that accident and took us to the National Library where we found the pilot's logbook and his diary of the events as well, and then compared them all to the accident records that exist for that um, particular incident. So it's been a real sort of splicing together of information. Probably the richest source that we have are the numerous logbooks that we have in the collection relating to people who were training here at Wigram and then later on at Number 2 School of General Reconnaissance up at Amaka and Nelson during the Second World War. And this has given us a, a big insight into um, who was flying it, when they were flying it and the kinds of things it was doing. And it's also led to us to realise that what we understood about its history previously is actually not correct and it wasn't even geographic in the same place we thought it was, it was actually in a different location, so that's really important. Um, I have a couple of logbooks here. Um, the first one is Leonard Trent, who some of you will know was the third and last VC to be awarded at the end of the Second World War for his part in a raid in 1943 with 487 Squadron. Um, he started off training here at Wigram and flew 102 on a number of occasions, most notably to the 1938 pageant up um, at Rongatai, which was the big first showcase of the RNZAF in its entirety to, for the public to sort of be exposed to it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but he flew it on a number of other occasions. But more typical of the types of things we have are, is this logbook here, which is, uh, relates to Albert Agar. Albert was um, one of the instructors here at Wigram during the immediate pre-war period um, and during the early part of the Second World War and his logbook is more typical in that he's basically taking junior trainee pilots up one after the other over and over again in 102 to take them on short flights and uh, dual training and various types of training to, to teach them how to fly a wildebeest and how to fly aircraft. So it just shows really how um, the aircraft was used as a sort of standard trainer for most of its career. But interestingly with this particular guy, he is reunited with the aircraft. Um, he flies in 1940 but then is reunited with the aircraft in 1942 um, because he transfers to the School of Reconnaissance up in Nelson and lo and behold there was 102 so they start flying again together. So of all the people we found so far, he's probably flying the aircraft the most. So far we have about 240 individual flights um, over the period 1934 to 1942. But we have some gaps, so we're constantly looking. And we've also had assistance from the public too. We've had a couple of uh, people 
uh, send in logbook entries for their um, ancestors too. So if you have any information like that, we'd really appreciate you getting in touch so that we can fill in a few more gaps in the history of NZ102. In addition to the importance of the technical aspects of the project, this part is also very important. It's the first time that we at the museum have tried to place an aircraft very much in the time that it existed, what it did whilst it was in service, where it went, who flew it, who was associated with it, and adding those stories to what is already a fascinating story and creating a much more three-dimensional picture of this particular aircraft. Given the fact that it's unique, that gives it an even greater significance and so we can really go to town on making sure people understand how important it is. We've spent the last year assessing all of the structure that we have uh, and trying to positively identify uh, all of the uh, parts of the airframe uh, and uh, work out which pieces uh, have the potential to be reused in the rebuild and which pieces are beyond saving and really only a reference uh, for patterns. The lack of engineering drawings has meant that this initial phase of the project has perhaps taken longer than it would have, um, but it's essential uh, so that we uh, really just know how much of a, uh, a structurally sound airframe we have. Yeah, we have, uh, we have faced a couple of challenges that are directly relating to uh, the global situation at the moment. Um, we were hoping to import from the UK materials, uh, imperial spec uh, materials uh, that would match as accurately as we possibly could the, the materials that were being used uh, at the time in the Wildebeest. Things like the sheet aluminium for panels, the, the tubing. Um, unfortunately, uh, the current situation with international shipping uh, has made that very difficult and very costly. So the likelihood is that we're going to have to source uh, the next closest equivalent uh, spec of material uh, probably from Australia uh, or maybe the United States. It's one of those situations where um, uh, you, you've got to be a little bit pragmatic. We would of course like to create uh, and leave an aircraft that, uh, f for future generations to learn from that represents uh, you know, very accurately the way that Vickers would have put one of these aircraft together back in the day. Um, there are times when that's just not possible. Um, museums have uh, you know, a great opportunity with static restorations that they can pursue a more accurate line with construction methods and rigging methods that for flying aircraft today uh, just wouldn't, um, wouldn't uh, reach inspection standards uh, or be permitted to fly. So we, we do want and hope to leave uh, a very accurate technical record in the collection when we're finished. Um, but as I say, sometimes you have to be pragmatic uh, just to get the project moving. Uh, we, we are hoping, obviously, that by the end of the, the project timeline, which is currently five years, that we will have a complete, uh, complete airframe, fully rigged, uh, fabric covered. Um, but of course, uh, with so many questions around uh, uh, whether we have enough reference material, uh, there's no guarantee that we'll reach that uh, outcome. So we've decided to have a number of uh, go, no go points along the way. Uh, when we get to the point that we have a fully uh, skeletal airframe, we will hopefully uh, by that point know whether we have enough information to take things to the next stage and consider installing systems uh, and rigging uh, to, to, to take things to the next step. If we don't, then we've decided that uh, a skeletal airframe will make a fantastic exhibit and will link beautifully to uh, a STEM program, for instance, uh, where, where exposed aircraft structure is so, so useful uh, you know, to talk about uh, technology. Um, as I said, it's five years at the moment. Uh, anybody in the audience that's had anything to do with restorations will understand that these things rarely go to plan. So the timeline may well uh, uh, step out a bit further. Um, and we may well pause the project at points where we hope that the research or the information we're getting from the public or from other institutions might catch up and just allow us to take things to that next step. So there you have a brief summary of our Vickers Fieldbeast project uh, and the challenges that we're facing. Um, it's an absolute privilege actually uh, for myself and my colleagues to be involved in this kind of work and to be trying to deliver a project of such historic significance, uh, not only to New Zealand, but as I said earlier, you know, this will be the only uh, type of this aircraft 
on display in a museum anywhere in the world when it's finished. So that really is uh, something uh, that we're really excited about. And we look forward to sharing progress uh, and updates on our social media platforms and our website uh, as things progress.